Pamela Lothi watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour or so, we'll see what's making the headlines with the columnist Carol Malone and the political editor of the Liverpool Echo, Liam Thorpe. Great to see you and uh, pleased to say they'll be with us right through until midnight for our extended news review. Get your thoughts in just a moment, as ever, to the front pages. The Eye reporting that an expected shortage of the Pfizer vaccine in the coming days could deal a blow to the planned reopening on June the 21st. The Times says ministers are considering delaying the end of coronavirus restrictions for a month to give businesses certainty and allow more time for people to receive two vaccinations. The Metro leads with the Health Secretary Matt Hancock's assertion that he didn't lie to the Prime Minister and there was no shortage of protective equipment in the early days of the pandemic. The Telegraph quoting the former Prime Minister Theresa May insisting that travel restrictions she calls incomprehensible have rendered Britain shut for business. Picturing the Prime Minister's infant son, the Daily Mail splashing on Boris Johnson and Joe Biden's meeting at the G7 summit in Cornwall, the headline, Oh Baby, What a Lovin'. Front page of The Guardian, bitter standoff over Brexit, sour start of G7 summit, carrying a warning from the French president Emmanuel Macron that nothing is negotiable over the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Sun offers encouragement to the England football team as the European Championships begin. The FT has word of rising prices for consumer goods in the US. That picture too of the leaders in Cornwall. So, Carol Malone and Liam Thorpe, we'll come on to that breaking news about vaccines in just a moment. But first of all, to the Daily Mail, Carol, um, a loving. What do you reckon about the, the body language and the bonhomie between the, the two leaders? <laughs> totally, totally unexpected. Uh, people might remember that it wasn't very long ago that Biden described Boris as a physical and emotional clone of Donald Trump. And, you know, we heard all these terrible stories that when Biden was elected that you know, he, he loved the EU, he hated Brexit, he would always prioritise the EU over us. Uh, and here we are today, and I mean, it is literally a love fest. One of the papers described it as a love fest. You know, Boris is actually saying that, that Biden has a breath of fresh air. Biden's bought Boris a bike and a new helmet. And look at them, they're just absolutely loving being together. And this, this to me is just, it's... It's such good news because I was worried about Biden when he was elected because of his stance over the EU. I was worried that he would be, you know, he would, he would, he would not do us harm, but he wouldn't help us. And it doesn't look like it's going to be like that. Whatever they felt about about Brexit and about what's happening in Northern Ireland currently, whatever they felt about it was hidden today. It, it looked like they were having a, a higher time and we can only hope that that carries on. They're going to talk about lots of things, you know, he said today, the summit hasn't started yet, but they did have meetings about Northern Ireland today. They did discuss things and they looked happy when they came out of it. So hopefully nothing is going to be a problem. This summit is going to solve lots of problems. Well, that's very optimistic, isn't it? And in fact, Jill Biden had the words love on her jacket, didn't she? Which some have, yes. uh, have, have made a point of, uh, of, of saying what a contrast that was to Melania Trump. I really don't care, do you? Uh, on a visit to a migrant child detention centre. Um, but uh, I, ha I hate to be cynical, but really for Joe Biden, uh, Liam, this really is about reasserting the democratic West as an important alliance after the Trump years and in the face of the autocrats of China, Russia, you name it, many others. So he's going to want smiles on the papers, isn't he? What, whatever happens, whatever happens behind the scenes, that's the look he wants. Absolutely. It's a, an important symbolic moment for, for the new president. And, of course, he wants to see America and, and present America as a, this outward-looking global nation, you know, rather than the very sort of insular, protectionist, America-first you know, country that, that Donald Trump was was so famous for for championing. I think it, you know Britain is 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 still going to be a, a massive massive ally, probably even more of an important ally when you consider what's going on in, in Russia and China. But you know, I admire Carol's optimism, but I, I do believe that there, there will be m more sort of tense difficulties regarding that Northern Ireland Protocol. We know, of course, um, from Patrick Maguire's story in the Times recently about the the you know rare demarche that was handed out. Um, you know, a diplomatic telling off, basically, from the US to the UK about the potential risk to the Good Friday Agreement. We know how passionate uh, Joe Biden is about maintaining that Good Friday Agreement and, and, and effectively the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I think that 
that maybe didn't it got skirted over a bit today i imagine uh, because they wanted this moment they wanted this important moment where they they, they get the, the headlines and the you know the pictures on the front page but i think there was probably a few thorny discussions to come on that one later in the week uh, yes, indeed. Lord Malik Brown told us earlier that the uh, the reason it was done by the US Chargé d'Affaires earlier was in order to park it and, 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 and make it all smiles today. So that's an important point. But let's move on to vaccination, shall we, which is one of the main uh, issues at stake here. Covid rebuilding uh, after the pandemic, getting nations through it. Financial Times uh, says the G7 summit will vaccinate the world, uh, saying leaders of the seven advanced economies will pledge to provide one billion coronavirus jabs to countries in need as part of this plan to vaccinate the world. We heard Joe Biden announcing the half billion from the US and that breaking news tonight from the British government uh, that surplus vaccines, they had talked generically about giving surplus vaccines, now confirmation that 100 million will be handed over. That factors in, we're told, the possibility of future virus resistant strains be, or vaccine resistant strains being detective, uh, detected. And this will be in addition to the 10 10 billion already committed in aid this year, presumably thereby neutering the argument about the cut in overseas development aid money that the, the UK is now giving. Uh, but are you pleased to see this, um, Carol? Do you think that the UK is, is, is stepping behind this pledge? I can, yes, I, I am. And I kind of expected it today. Gordon Brown was interviewed much earlier today and has been interviewed in previous days. And he has he has hinted that we would give 100 million doses. He said it today. And he said that, you know, Biden's 500 million or 100. He said other countries would get it up to 1 billion. But as he says, 1 billion is nowhere near enough. It's going to take 11 billion to vaccinate the world. And what, he, what Gordon Brown is saying should happen at this summit is that the, all the leaders should agree to setting up a separate fund to make sure that happens because one billion isn't going to cut it and he's saying if you know if you're going to make a pledge to vaccinate the world you're not going to be able to do it with one billion vaccinations and you know he's kind of right and if, if nothing else comes out of this summit and that does well then this this is this will be really good news because we've been talking about this for a very long time we've been talking about as you said Anna, surplus doses and all the rest but we've never quite made it happen biden is saying it's going to happen but i'll tell you the one thing that actually um i was a bit shocked at today it was like a marketing film for Pfizer today with, with the boss of Pfizer standing next to Joe Biden at that press conference. You know, there are other vaccines apart from Pfizer. And um, there, you know, we AstraZeneca seems to be wiped off the slate. One of the cheapest vaccines on the planet, which actually does the job incredibly well, is not being talked about. Only Pfizer, which is like 30 quid a dose, is being talked about, as opposed to AstraZeneca, well, yeah, which just, is about two pounds fifty. Yeah, just so just that on that point, then, it. just on just on that that point, uh, we're also told uh, by the government today that the prime minister will ask the G7 leaders to encourage pharmaceutical companies to adopt the Oxford AstraZeneca model of providing vaccines vaccines at cost for the duration of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, we're told also Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson have already pledged to share 1.3 billion doses on a non-profit basis with developing countries. Mm -hmm. So clearly, Liam, trying to push these other companies to share the Oxford AstraZeneca model that the British government, to be fair, has been very proud about. Yeah, it has. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's led, it has led, by example, one and we want to see Pfizer and, and Moderna and these other ones, you know, commit to that. And there has been some commitment on that because we don't want to see people getting incredibly, incredibly rich off what is, you know, an absolutely now essential uh, thing for the world. So obviously, the, the, you know, it's it's a start today. I, I agree with Carol, and it's nice to hear Carol quoting Gordon Brown. Um, but he makes a really good point that you know it, it, it needs to be a lot more than this because at the end of the day, this is this is both the morally correct thing to do, but it's also the the entirely sensible thing to do for everyone's interest. You know, we, do, we, we can't progress as a, as, a, as a world, we can't progress as international communities until everyone is, is protected. So, you know, we, we, we've seen to our cost in this country how other nations not being vaccinated has come back to, to haunt us as well. So it was good to see that. And I think, to be fair to Joe Biden, I think he's, he's led on this from even before he was elected. This was always something that he was, he was aiming for. And, and, and America can obviously play an enormous role in this. It's, you know, I think the bar... The bar was extremely low from from the last president, but I, you know, you would never have imagined President Trump saying anything like that. Um, you know, he's entirely focused on what was going on in America. So it was it was a, a bit of the you know to quote the prime minister, it was a bit of a breath of fresh air to hear the U.S. president speaking about these kind of you know global intentions to help the world, basically.
Yeah, well, watch out. I think President Trump will claim he fast-tracked the vaccine programme in America. So uh, if he was listening to you right now, I'm not sure he'd agree. But uh, uh, to the eye now, um, just on, on the AstraZeneca jab to the Oxford vaccine creator, Sarah Gilbert, has told the paper that booster dose um, has produced a much stronger immune response than expected in preliminary tests. So we watch and wait for more detail on that. Uh, but the main story, obviously, as you can see, is that there's a, a Pfizer jab shortage um, hitting hopes for the 21st of June because of this enormous response from under 30s. I don't know how old you, you are, Liam. Probably younger than me and Carol, to be fair. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, I mean, it's been great to... Well, your quick reaction, first of all, about the, you know, this great demand from younger people, if you don't mind, Liam. Yeah, sadly, I'm just over 30, but um, I have had one of my jabs. But yeah, I, I have to say, having reported on COVID and, and been a, obviously a strong advocate of vaccines for, for the last year, and, and see, you see a lot on social media of people, you know, you get anti-vax stuff, you get people claiming that young people won't go for it. It's been incredibly heartening. You know, those scenes at Twickenham the other week of people, you know, young people not sitting in the pub on their days off, they were queuing around the block. It was it was really beautiful to see. And we're now at a situation, obviously, where it, it, it's starting to make, you know, the, the numbers a little bit tight in terms of the Pfizer vaccine. I, I think it's great that that many people are coming forward and hopefully we can get to a point where, where they can all get their jabs. Because at the end of the day, this isn't just about people getting seriously ill and dying. We know loads of, of young people who've got COVID who are still suffering with, with long COVID, with those, you know, those really debilitating symptoms. So we really do need to get everyone vaccinated. I think that's become clear. What we are seeing is rising cases. We, we hopefully won't see that, that serious surge in hospital admissions. But if we do start to see that bit of extra pressure on the NHS, we know that that's going to roll over into other treatments. So I think everyone of every age getting vaccinated is absolutely essential right now. And Carol, how do you, um, how do you feel about the Monday announcement from the Prime Minister about whether there might be a delay a month? Uh, we saw in one of the papers, two to four weeks suggested. Do you think it's sensible to try and get more people vaccinated or are you all gung-ho to go? I'm, I'm in between two two stools here because yes, I think we should be going because people are are getting the virus. More people are getting it now, and 95, 91 percent of all new COVID cases are the Delta variant. But they're not dying from it. Fewer people are dying all the time. Hospitals are not overrun with this. This is going to be COVID is going to become like a flu. And, and and if that's the case, we have to open the country for business. You wouldn't keep the country closed for a, for a bad dose of flu. So why are we doing it? For, for this, you know, a two week delay is not going to be the end of the world, but it really has to be the last one. And, and, and you know, if we're, we're saying that, yes, COVID cases are increasing, but hospital and the hospital admissions are increasing slightly, but they're not serious. They're not serious cases. N nowhere near as many people are dying now. So, you know, we have to accept that COVID is going to be part of our lives and we can't keep the, the airlines industry closed, the travel industry closed, as Theresa May says in, one of, in the Telegraph tomorrow, that, you know, we're, we're closed for business yeah. this country and we can't be. We have to reopen for business. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in more detail after the break, in fact. Just wanted to point out the eye, like the Times yesterday, talked about plans to fast-track wedding uh, backlog of 200,000 couples. So uh, perhaps talk about that too, Theresa May's evidence and the evidence too of Matt Hancock. Uh, does the Health Secretary's claim that there was no shortage of PPE early in the pandemic stand up to scrutiny? Back with that in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. With me now, Carol Malone and Liam Thorpe. To the Metro we go. Liam, you kick this off. Hancock's half hour was uh, well over that, four and a half hours nearly. Uh, some really important evidence tackled. What did you make of it? Yeah, um, I thought it was pretty pretty offensive, really. I thought there was a lot of the health sector trying to, trying to rewrite history. Obviously, as it says on the, on the Metro there, that probably the big headline was him claiming that there was not really a PPE shortage that, that put health workers, um, you know, in, in, in the front line in danger. And I think I think everyone knows that's not true. We saw pictures of nurses, of carers wearing bin bags. I personally have spoken to, to hospital workers who didn't have what they what they required. And I know many other journalists have as well. I thought he was selective in, in his evidence. He quoted an NAO report, which, uh, which to, to, to back up his claim, but that same report, he helpfully missed out a bit, which said that there was a shortage of PPE and that there was a really difficult situation for frontline workers. The Public Accounts Committee also said there was an appalling situation regards PPE. So that was just one of, of many areas where I don't think he was quite sticking to the truth. Another one was on, was on the lockdown situation and another one on care homes. So I think a lot of people will have been watching that being extremely frustrated and seeing the health secretary trying to wriggle out of things, really. You've got 20 seconds, Carol. 
He blamed everyone but himself for every cock-up that has happened during this pandemic. The worst of all being the care homes, trying to blame care workers for bringing the virus into the care homes and killing patients in there. That was shocking even for Hancock.